Project, project Challenge and uh, we have, have just done a presentation on the challenges and trends in a PMO career. Um, we basically split the presentation into two parts and uh, uh, I'm going to talk about the challenges and trends around finding work and new opportunities and Eileen Roden is going to have a look at the challenges and trends um, while you're actually in post. We'll take a look at the challenges from uh, the finding new opportunities perspective first of all. We can see that uh, the first challenge is about understanding what organisations are really looking for when they want to hire uh, PMO. I think what um, I've found over the years is that actually because PMOs differ so much within uh, different organisations and across different types of organisations, different sectors and so on, is that from a PMO professional's point of view, when it comes to finding new opportunities, the trying to understand exactly what that organisation is looking for um, is, is actually quite a difficult thing to do because there are so many variations. But also, but um, there's variations in terms of maturity of organisations and their PMOs. Um, and often when you're looking at opportunities that are out there, it's actually quite difficult to ascertain exactly you know, what kind of PMO it is, what kind of functions and services that it has, and whether it's the right kind of thing for you in your career at that particular moment in time. Um, basically we see quite a lot of, I suppose, common grievances from PMO professionals, and I think you know, this list here that you're seeing is, is probably going to strike a chord with many PMO people uh, that are looking at this presentation today. Um, but so many people that kind of get burnt, the fingers get burnt by taking an opportunity that they um, is, is not quite panning out uh, in the way that they uh, are being led to believe, but it will do. So a new job, um, you know, it's not what you're being being led to believe, but also. Um, an organisation uh, almost sell a PMO role to people and, um, and, on, and often it can be uh, oversold in that actually the PMO is probably not as well supported across that business have, as you've been led to believe, which can lead to uh, you know, uh, uh, grievances about, well, you know, if, it's, if it's not a PMO that uh, is, is well supported, where is that? You know, where's that PMO going in terms of um, in terms of its maturity uh, and, and the option, the opportunity that comes from being able to improve the functions and services within that particular PMO? So some of the roles might not be as in depth as you've been led to believe, um, but also you know the development uh, might not be there either. So there's you know it's, there's, there's questions to be asked um, as you're looking for opportunities to understand and to try and get beyond the, okay, this PMO is being sold to, the, to me at the moment, but I want to know the truth, I want to know exactly what I'm going to face if I think this opportunity is, is worth it, you know, going for or, or, or at least being interviewed for. So this is where you really need to show your experience and skills um, in an interview by being able to ask the right questions, to try and work out exactly what kind of PMO situation do we have here and is it the right one for me in my career. And um, people always ask me, well, you know, what are the, the right questions to ask? And actually that's the whole point of things like PMO flash mob. It's where you come along and talk to other people that have been in these kind of situations and talk amongst yourself to find those answers. Might be a bit of a cop-out, but you know, ultimately that's what PMO flash mob is all about. So the second challenge in terms of finding an opportunity in a PMO career is about being clear with your own experience and skills and competences in a CV. It might be really um, an obvious thing to, to put down there, but I think sometimes we forget that the simplest things are the things that we need to focus on and do right, rather than worrying too much about writing a great CV. So being clear with your own experience, skills and competences in a, in a, in a project management, a, sorry, in a, in a PMO CV is about being able to understand what the person is that, that's looking for a PMO person um, is ideally looking to see in the CV. I mean, one of the things that I find a lot in conversation from people that are recruiting around PMO is that in their opinion that there's not enough good PMO people around. And the interesting thing for me is that actually there are a lot of big, good PMO people around. Some of them don't actually do themselves much justice in terms of how they put together their CV. 
And what you're seeing here on the screen is just a, a high-level view about what we like to see these are the different kinds of functions and services. So for example, a function would be something like planning and a service would be something like uh, the maintenance of a plan or um, you know, updating uh, certain milestone reports and that kind of thing. So the function is a high level thing like the planning and the services are the, you know, the, 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 the actual tasks and activities that you do. So when you're putting together a CV, it makes sense that you naturally group the services, the functions, the services together. And what I tend to see a lot with the PMO CV is that planning tends to be scattered around the CV in a works experience, which makes it incredibly difficult for somebody trying to understand exactly what your planning experience is. You know, so it's, it's a simple uh, way of looking at it, but it's often the simplest things that can make a big difference. So from a CV point of view is that often you'll get things like um, it's not very clear about what type of PMO person you actually are. So it sounds odd, but you know, you can look at a CV that says I'm a PMO coordinator, but I've got no idea whether you're working in a project or program or a portfolio or indeed any of those combinations. So it's about being able to quite clearly demonstrate what kind of PMO person you are, but also the type of PMO that you're, you're working within. From that, it's also trying to get a feel for how complex or complicated your PMO role might be. Trying to get an idea about the complexity or size of your, your project office, your PMO, also helps somebody trying to, who's, who's looking for a PMO person to, to understand more about where you're pitched at. You know, there's a big difference between working within a project office where you're supporting one or two projects and the project of a, a, a budget of under a million pounds versus somebody that's working within a program like PMO where actually the projects are programs that are actually lasting for a number of years and the budgets into the multi-millions. So again, it's about thinking about how do you best put forward this is the kind of PMO person that you are. Other things that are, are on there are the stuff like, you know, the obvious things that tasks and skills can be missing. And often that's because you're not quite sure about what tasks and skills I should be including. So the list that we've just put together that you've just seen there in the previous slide actually is, gives you some idea about what you can expect to and put, actually put on your CV and what people are actually expecting to read. Challenge three is about carving out a successful and varied PMO career. This is about understanding more about the PMO career in a wider context. You know, it's about understanding what opportunities are actually there for you, rather than just thinking, you know, I'd rather you know, stay in the same PMO for many years to come, which is perfectly fine. But actually, there's a lot of other types of opportunity out there. And you have a duty to yourself to really to understand what the PMO landscape looks like outside your own organisation. So the challenge is about understanding what other people are doing, understanding where you can go, but also how do you get there? It's one of the things that PMO Flashmob can give to you is access to different people, different places that they're working, different types of PMO, different challenges that they've got, different skill sets and so on. And it's only, I've found personally, by having one-to-one -one conversations that some of this stuff tends to come out, you know? So these are the other kind of things that um, you know, are important to be finding out about. I mean, if you're in a a project, a PMO career, um, you kind of owe it to yourself to, to find out about different types of roles, different levels of seniority, you know, how does one move from a project administrator through the ranks up to PMO analyst to PMO manager, understanding what your skills gaps are and how you're potentially going to go uh, and find out how you're going to be able to fill those in, um, about how you get better at what you're doing, how to change organisations and how to maybe move from being a permanent employee to uh, more of a, a contractor or freelancer. So there's different opportunities, and again, people are out there that are doing these things, and you know, flash mobs are a great place to, to talk to those people and to find out from their own experiences. You'd be surprised at just how much you'll take away from that. So we've identified three challenges when you're actually in post in a PMO that perhaps you'll come across and certainly what we're seeing in a number of PMOs out there in the industry. And the very first challenge, which is a really sad challenge, is the fact that actually survival, keeping our PMO going um, despite what happens in the organisation. 
and ESI published a research earlier on this year where they identified that over 70% of the PMOs were actually challenged by their senior management. We also had 37% challenged even by the project managers. So those individuals where we provide products and services really kind of question back why the PMO is in existence, what's it really there to do. And we often have conversations around, well, why do finance not have to do this? Why do HR not have to do this? Why is it the PMO always have to justify their existence? Unfortunately, it is the, the where we are at the moment, and so we have to be able to do that. So if we really want to keep our PMO going and surviving through all of this, uh, this upheaval, then there are potentially kind of four things that we really need to uh, do within our PMOs. So the first thing is we need to perform consistently well. We do not have the opportunity to have a downwind to produce reports that are um, not up to scratch, that have wrong information in or inaccurate information in. If we do that, we almost immediately lose credibility and our reports will continue to be questioned and that calls the whole PMO into question. So we have to kind of maintain that kind of high level of performance. And we often find that actually the most kind of the people who with the highest quality um, standards are those people who are sitting within the PMO. So that's something we have to do. We also need to know our worth. We need to be able to articulate what are the functions and services that we offer, who we offer them to, and understand what value they are to the organisation. There's no point in saying kind of people asking us that question if we don't have that answer. And there's a real challenge to us if we actually don't understand what we're doing and who we're doing it for, and what added value that brings to the organisation. So the third thing I would suggest we also need to do is regularly engage with our stakeholders. Now, when I talk about engaging with our stakeholders, I'm not talking about kind of the day-to-day -day interaction we have when we're talking to the project manager about their plans, when we're talking kind of steering groups about the health of the, the projects or programs perhaps that we're ensuring. I'm talking about still having those kind of conversations, but getting an understanding of what their current challenges are and, and start thinking about what the additional kind of functions and services and how we can add value. And also also checking out whether the functions and services that we're currently offering still have the value they had when we first set them up. So it's really important, as my final point says, about actually kind of staying relevant to the current challenges and the current portfolio that we're delivering with our organisation. And that takes us on to the second challenge. So the second challenge is really about staying relevant, growing and maturing with our organisations. Very often PMOs are set up to answer a kind of specific need or to deal with a particularly large program or because the organisation is going through a new change or perhaps a new person has been appointed. And there's, very, uh, there's danger in thinking that actually we have, we've now got a kind of a high performing PMO, very mature in its processes and then assuming that that is going to remain the same for six months, 12 months to come. Very often organisation changes, changes to the portfolio, things that happen in the industry will change what is important for us to provide as functions and services. And if we don't understand what's happening with the business, then we can't respond accordingly. So we need to be in this kind of current state of potential transformation or actual transformation. And that doesn't mean what we need to be doing is kind of chopping and changing our uh, processes and systems every week or every month. We need to obviously kind of plan it and kind of work that through. But we do need to know what's happening with the business. And, uh, and that's not just in terms of what's delivery. What are the business challenges? What's happening with our competitors? How is the business strategy going to be changing over the next kind of two, three, five years? And what's that going to mean for the, the size and shape of our portfolio? How is that going to impact the types of information, the types of decisions that are going to be made? And, and whether that's based on kind of some kind of cost constraints or particular focus in a, a, an area of our business. We really need to understand that. We also need to, what's happening, when I've said there in the industry, it's not our organisation's industry, but in the project and programme management industry. Do we know what the latest trends are? Why is change management at the moment having a sudden kind of surgence of kind of interest? Why is that suddenly important? Benefits management over the last kind of three, uh, three years or so has really kind of come off the too hard pile. 
what other organisations do now there? Is our software kind of uh, enable us to kind of do proper benefits management, proper benefits realisation? So all of these things from a from a PMO perspective, we need to understand what's out there, what potentially we can do for our organisation, and again being able to articulate how that would be useful for the senior managers and the project community that we work in. One of the interesting things as well was when we're putting our processes in place is to recognise the maturity of our project and programme managers. In how good are they, how experienced are they, how mature are our processes and our systems. Often when uh, an organisation is taking a real effort to kind of uh, embed project management, a lot of their processes are very prescriptive. Are they now kind of outdated and the project managers are kind of far more capable understanding of projects in the organisation is much better understood and we actually need to start thinking about providing a little bit more flexibility and allowing the project and programme managers to use their professional judgement in terms of what and how things are going to be delivered. And conversely, people often see kind of develop the maturity of their processes to get up to something that's kind of far more kind of sophisticated. What I've found in a number of clients that I work with is actually as you go through a reorganisation or there's been a significant change, the actual level of maturity, not based on the individuals who are actually delivering projects, but the organisation kind of structure and the culture of the organisation actually reduces the, uh, the maturity level of that organisation. So sometimes you have to kind of step in and become more prescriptive around some of those processes or actually kind of reduce the number of processes that have to be in place. So all of these things from a PMO perspective we need to keep in mind as we're looking ahead towards what we offer to our organisations. And I think the most difficult thing um, that we need to realise is that we cannot wait for the organisation to come to us and say we're interested now in doing some benefits management, we're interested now in moving our head with our developing sponsor capability in the organisation. We actually have to be prepared and ready to be able to deliver that as and when the organisation comes. So we need to be very much forward thinking and also going back to our first first challenge of survival, we also need to continue to perform at a very high level on a consistent basis. So the, so the third challenge for uh, PMOs is this area about uh, maintaining our position in the organisation. Mature PMOs uh, very often get into a, a position where they're accepted by the project management community, they have got some links into senior management and potentially the C-suite, and they are doing a level of assurance um, on projects and programmes. And what I see happen sometimes is what I would say PMOs try to get kind of too big for their boots and what they try and do is they think they have got the authority to decide which projects need to be undertaken, they decide the prioritisation of the projects or they decide or even I've seen some uh, PMOs actually try and do the project plan and give it to the project manager and say actually this is the project you're delivering and I've done, I've done you a schedule for you to deliver to. I just want to kind of take us back and I recognise that not everybody is kind of aligned to the P3 or uh, framework, but the, it's useful definition of a PMO which I think encompasses um, almost all PMOs is that we're both a delivery support and we're a deci decision enabling function. We're not there to make decisions on behalf of the organisation. If we think about the kind of the devolved, uh, the delegated authority, you know, from an organisation um, delegates authority down to the sponsor to deliver some benefits and the sponsor then delegates down to the project or programme manager to produce the deliverables that are going to deliver those benefits. At no point does the project manager have the authority to make those decisions or held accountable for delivery. Now it becomes quite interesting from an assurance perspective than in say, well actually I'm doing insurance on behalf of the organisation so surely I can kind of say when things are not going right and things where things should be stopped. And I'm kind of quite comfortable with that. We do want to get away from kind of uh, 
kind of becoming the kind of the naysayer all the time. But what we should be doing is actually reflecting back on the organisation and being able to say to them, we want you to understand that if you make a decision around this particular project, or more importantly, if you don't make a decision around this particular project, this is what the potential impact is for your organisation. So we become a trusted advisor and somebody who the organisation or the project managers come and ask for advice and guidance, but that is given and it's not necessarily taken. We have to make sure that accountability for projects and programmes actually stays with those who are accountable for delivery. So we've covered off the six challenges. We've got understanding what organisations are really looking for when they hire PMOs, being clear with your own experience, skills and competencies, carving out a successful and varied PMO career, and from actually imposed challenges, remaining in existence, as for the year from Eileen, growing and maturing within the organisation and with the organisation, maintaining our assurance and governance roles without overstepping the mark.